Hello, welcome to my channel or welcome back if you've been here before. I'm Beth Ann, and today I'm doing the Mid-Year Book Freakout Tag 2021 edition that everyone's been doing. Um, I'm not going to tag anyone. I wasn't tagged. This is just everybody should do it. So if you're watching this video and you're a booktuber and you haven't done it yet, please uh, go ahead and do this tag. So let's jump right in. Question number one, the best book you've read so far in 2021. This is such a hard question. So I divided my reading up a little bit into some categories. So we have four categories. So in poetry, I, I only read two poetry collections in the first half of this year. So I read Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Wong, and I read Transfer by Naomi Shihab Nye. Um, both were quite good, but Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Wong was amazing. So that is my pick for poetry category. Then in nonfiction, um, I read a decent amount of nonfiction, but it, it's a whole variety, you know, some were history or cultural, political, some were scientific, some were biography, autobiography, memoir. Um, so I have two for my nonfiction category. So first is Paying the Land by Joe Sacco, um, which I don't have because I got it from the library, but I'll put an image up. So that is comics journalism um, about an indigenous group of people in British Columbia in Canada. Uh, focusing specifically on sort of their history over the past 100, 150 years or so. So what happened with residential schools for that nation and um, sort of the background leading up to now, what's going on with natural resources conflict and conflict over ownership of natural resources um, where the colonial Canadian government um, is uh, is extracting resources that, that should belong to the indigenous people and um, there's a lot of tension about, um, about that process. Um, so that was really, really excellent book. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, but then I also wanted to shout out a very different book, which is All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, which I also got from the library, so don't have. And that is a memoir. Um, it's an interesting memoir because it's geared a little bit more towards sort of a YA middle grade high school audience because George M. Johnson is telling their experience of growing up uh, sort of through the end of college as a uh, queer black person um, uh, in the U.S. And I, I just thought it was beautifully written. Um, I thought they targeted their audience really well. It's the sort of thing that, even though I don't own it currently, at some point I'll probably buy because I would like my daughter to read it, um, even though um, she may not share any of the identities in that book um, that George M. Johnson discusses. She might, but, you know, just uh, I think every young person should read it. Uh, I thought it was a very important, beautifully done book. Um, so I wanted to highlight that as one of my favorites as well in the nonfiction category. Um, so then in fiction, I'm splitting into two groups. So for fiction, young adult, um, I had a f several different choices. Let's see if I can go down my list really quickly. Actually, I had fewer choices, I guess, in the young adult category. Anyway, I went with The Stars and the Blackness Between Them by Junata Petras, which I have gushed about previously on my channel, so I'll include a link to my review of this below. But in short, it is a queer YA romance. It is definitely sort of older YA, if that makes sense. So even though the characters are teens, I found this sort of incredibly accessible and relatable as an adult. Um, the, the two teens here are incredibly mature and like all teens, they're dealing with very adult topics. Um, just, uh, you know, they're not quite adults. Um, but this this book, utterly fantastic. There's a little bit of a um, fantastical element, especially towards the end. There's also a lot of emphasis on spirituality and exploring spirituality as a teenager. Um, and there's a lot of social justice stuff that's not necessarily... I mean, I would say it's not centered in the book, but I think a lot of people reading this book would be like, that seems totally centered. Um, uh, I thought it was was incredibly well uh, well integrated. The focus is really on the story of these two young women, um, but there's a lot going on in their world um, that I think is handled beautifully. Loved this book. All right, so then fiction adult. This is where I had a lot of choices of <laughs> books that I really loved. So among some of my choices, were Undrowned by River Solomon, Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, The Death of Vivek Oji by Kweke Ameze, Amezi, Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes, Maurice by E.M. Forster, 
Um, so a lot of varied literature, but I was sort of looking down that list of things that I'd given a five-star rating to and Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes really rose to the top. And I think that's interesting because um, I think this is one of Langston Hughes's early novels. And some of the things that I think other people have sort of criticized as like being an early novel with imperfections were actually things I really appreciated and liked about this book. Um, it's, it is sort of a coming of age story of a young black man, um, in, oh gosh, in the early 20th century, I guess. Um, I'll link to the video where I discuss it, uh, below, but to me, it just, it, it, part of it is a nostalgia. So sort of the way it was written, the atmosphere of the writing recaptured the feeling of some of the other coming of age stories set in a similar time that I read when I was a kid that really spoke to me even though they were by white female authors. So I'm thinking of like the Anne of Green Gables series. It's like there's a similarity in style and era in the in those books by those authors um, that gave me sort of that nostalgic pull. Um, but yeah, I just, this is a beautiful story told amazingly in Langston Hughes's amazing writing. Um, it doesn't end with like a specific plot point. There isn't sort of like a rising action going on here. It's just sort of the story of this kid's childhood. Um, and it ends on a very positive, uh, positive point, but like not, yeah, not, not sort of like your typical novel where it's all like leading up to something and then something happens. Um, and I just, I really sort of loved that almost, I don't want to say unfinished because I, to me, the novel felt finished. But that open-ended quality, um, like a chapter didn't necessarily end in this kid's life um, and it's just so open-ended thinking about where he's going to go, but you have all of this hope at the end of the book. So yeah, I just, ugh, I love this book. I think everyone should read this book too. Um, okay, so those are my favorite books of 2021. Seven minutes in, let's go quickly now. Okay. Best sequel I've read so far in 2021. So that has to be Across the Green Grass Fields by Shannon McGuire. I forget what number this is in uh, Shannon's Wayward Children series, but I love that series. I thought this book was a great addition to it. Question number three, a new release you haven't read yet, but want to. Um, I got this, Fire with Fire by Destiny Soria, which I think is a YA novel. Um, I'll just read one paragraph from the jacket. Danny and Eden Rivera were born to kill dragons, but that's the only thing the sisters have in common. For Danny, dragon slaying takes a backseat to everyday high school life. For Eden, slaying is her life, yet they both agree on one thing. Where dragons are concerned, it's kill or be killed. High school drama, dragons, I'm in. Um, question number four, most anticipated release for the second half of the year. I do a terrible job of paying attention to releases. If they're really getting hyped on Twitter, I'll know about them, but I also don't have a huge book buying budget and, um, want to be very careful about releases I pay attention to, so I end up not paying much attention to them. The one person whose releases I've been paying a lot of attention to is Rebecca Weatherspoon, um, who is a romance author. And so the third book in her Cowboys of California trilogy is coming out October 26th, 2021. I have already pre-ordered it. It is a thorn in the saddle. I will put up a picture of the cover here and I'm very, very excited for it. So, um, okay, number five, biggest disappointment. And number six, biggest surprise, because I was surprised that it was a little bit disappointing. Um, this is The Killing Moon by N.K. Jemisin, which is the first book in her Dreamblood duology. And um, it was a disappointment just because it didn't absolutely blow me away. I mean, if, if your first experience with N.K. Jemisin, like mine, was reading The Broken Earth, uh, everything is not as good as that. I mean, obviously. So yeah, sort of a disappointment and a surprise. It's still a good book. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, question number seven, favorite new author, debut or new to me? So this is just new to me. And again, it's Rebecca Weatherspoon, who I love. I already, as I was putting answers to these tags, I was like, well, now everything is going to be about Rebecca Weatherspoon once I've mentioned her one time. Um, so again, romance author, uh, she does sort of very diverse and inclusive and uh, empowering romance. And I really love it. Um, Question number eight, newest fictional crush. I don't get real crushes on fictional characters like a lot of other booktubers I follow have been saying, but I think the closest thing that would come to that is the character Jessie Pleasant, who is in Rebecca Weatherspoon's Cowboys of California series. 
Um, he is the older brother to the uh, male protagonists in the first two books of that series, and he is going to be the centerpiece of the third book that is coming out in October. And I love him, so I'm so excited to read his love story because he's been a secondary character in the first two books. Um, question number nine, newest favorite character. So this was also a little bit hard because I also don't really get, I don't know, I'm, I feel like I'm a character driven reader, but then I don't necessarily sit around thinking about the characters after I've read about them. I don't know. Um, this is a little bit hard too, but just going through things I've recently written, uh, whoa, recently read. Um, I want to go with Elle Jones, um, from Written in the Stars by Alexandria Belfour. So she's one of the two leads. Um, who find romance in that book. Um, and Elle Jones was just such a lovely, lovely person and sort of scatterbrained and messy. And, you know, just she just seems so interesting. And so she is someone that I would love to, to grab a cup of coffee with um, and maybe be friends with. So I'm going to go with Elle Jones. Um, question 10, a book that made you cry. Um, yeah, a lot of books make me sort of tear up. Um, I'm not I think other people have this experience too. Like I don't really cry much in real life, but then books for some reason and movies too. I like sob during movies um, and books. Yeah. A lot of books can make me uh, tear up. Um, so most recently Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. It's not a book tag unless I work Dragon Lance into it. So I just finished this last night. That's a book I've been rereading since I was in high school. Um, parts of it are just beautifully written and just really tug on the heartstrings. And then I also have the nostalgia of having been reading it for 15 years. And so, yeah, definitely teared up at several places towards the end of that book where things got really intense. Um, and then the other, uh, one is The Stars and the Blackness Between Them by Junata Petras. Like I said, these two women are dealing with some intense stuff. And so this was the sort of book I was basically, I couldn't put it down. So I was sort of snatching bits here and there as I was hanging out with my daughter and my partner. Um, and so I'd like, I'd like snatch a bit. And then even if I felt like I could still read another couple pages, I'd be like, I have to put it down so I don't start bawling. <laughs> And like, not because it's sad or heartbreaking. It is sad, but there's so much hope and joy written through this that it was like, it was those sorts of tears were just like, I'm feeling so many emotions right now that like, I need to put the book down so that my kid doesn't like wonder why is mom crying? Like mom never cries and now she's sobbing over a book. Um, so that one. Okay. Question 12. Most beautiful book you've bought so far this year or received? Um, I'm pretty... Catholic with my artistic tastes, I tend to find a lot of things really, really pleasant to look at. So I was like, I don't really want to wade through huge stacks of books because I'll end up with like 20 options. So I went, uh, I just looked at like one shelf and just picked out a couple things. Um, so one is a book that I'm currently reading and really enjoying, which is Steeped in Gold. Um, so this was released earlier this year. Um, and it's a little hard to tell on the cover because it's the background is like beautiful, really dark green and black. Um, sort of uh, mixed in together, if that makes sense. I don't know. But then there's all these gold highlights. The two women on the front are absolutely gorgeous. And I just love shiny gold. So I think this is a really beautiful cover. And again, the book is not disappointing. I'm almost 100 pages in and it's it's pretty exciting so far. Um, and then for a, an entirely different aesthetic, um, this was an impulse buy. I went into Barnes and Noble to look for birthday presents for my mom and was successful and Impulse bought a couple things for myself as well. So I haven't read this yet. I don't really know anything about it. This is Broken April by Ismail Kadar Kadare. And it's um, it was a winner of the Man Booker International Prize. Um, so I'm expecting it to be pretty great, but I just love the gorgeous mountain views. And then the description on the back starts, um, two destinies intersect in Broken April. The first is that of uh, Gior, I might be uh, butchering these, you're a young mountaineer who, much against his will, has just killed a man in order to avenge the death of his older brother, and who expects to be killed himself in keeping with the provisions of the code that regulates life in the highlands. The second is that of a young couple on their honeymoon who have come to study the age-old customs of the place, including the blood feud. Um, so this takes place in the highlands of Albania, um, and I think it takes place in the Dark Ages, um, which is why it sounds a little old. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this and I think it's beautiful. Um, okay. And last thing, question number 13, what books do you need to read by the end of the year? So 
I feel personally attacked by this question because obviously the answer is all of them, as many as possible. Um, but I do want to highlight two. So um, these are ones that I put in my big book summer reading challenge um, that I just think are really important for me to read for various reasons. So one is The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. I do own this and I also own Cast and I just really want to catch up um, with Isabel Wilkerson because everybody says these books are amazing. It's a topic that is near and dear to my heart that I need to learn more about. Um, I've seen a lot of interviews of her, clips in various documentaries, um, talking about just her work in general um, and, you know, bringing out her knowledge. Um, and I, yeah, I just can't wait to do it. But it's, you know, it can be daunting to pick up a big, thick nonfiction book. So I put it in my big book summer challenge to motivate myself. And this is definitely, if there are any books where it's like Bethann, homework, read these by the end of the year, it would be this one. And then the other one is Lakota America, which is, um, I forget how it's, yeah, A New History of Indigenous Power. Um, and so I am really excited about this. So um, it's the, the jacket says this first complete account of the Lakota Indians traces their rich and often surprising history from the early 16th to the early 21st century. Um, so this was also sort of an impulse buy, um, but I live in uh, Minnesota. And so I am a little disappointed in myself. I've had this on my bookshelf for, I think about two years now. I impulse bought it when I got to Minnesota. Um, and so as, as one way to learn about um, the history of the place where I live and, and nearby places, um, so I work all around this whole area, uh, I just, this feels like responsible, um, like I just need to do this to be a responsible person in this space. Um, and I would really love to do this before I move away from Minnesota, which I'm doing um, next month. So I also need to read this. Okay, that is it for the mid-year, what is this even called? Mid-year book freak out tag. Um, if you want to stick around, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Um, and again, I'm going to link to videos where I've talked about some of the books that I've mentioned in the description box below. And um, I hope you're all actually, well, I'm filming this on the weekend, but by the time it goes up, I hope you had a great weekend and I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.